Oscar Tromboli is passionate about using the gift of listening to bring positive changes in homes, workplaces, and around the world. Through his work with chairs, boards of directors, and executive teams in local, regional, and global organizations, Oscar has experienced firsthand the transformational impact leaders and organizations can have when they listen beyond the words, and he helps us bring that skill into the exam room. He talks about giving attention instead of paying attention, how to frame questions so they won't be perceived as judgmental, how to utilize silence, and when it is actually okay to interrupt our patients. Oscar is a marketing and technology industry veteran with over 30 years' experience across general management, sales, marketing, and operations for Microsoft, PeopleSoft, Polycom, Professional Advantage, and Vodafone. During his time as a marketing director at Microsoft, he was accountable for the five-year journey to move Microsoft Office from DVDs to the data center. He consults to organizations including 20th Century Fox, AstraZeneca, Google, HSBC, PayPal, Qantas, Reebok, TripAdvisor, and Universal Music. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Physician Wealth Services, PWS, is a fee-only financial planning firm devoted to the financial well-being of physicians. Ryan Inman, founder of PWS and creator and host of the Financial Residency Podcast, developed a sense of responsibility to help physicians with their financial goals after witnessing how vulnerable his wife, a physician, was to poor financial advice during her residency. He was shocked at how many advisors tried to take advantage of her and her peers. Ryan started PWS as a fee-only practice so he could work exclusively with physicians who could truly benefit from unbiased, quality financial advice. Working with Ryan is simple and transparent. There are no assets under management fees, no products being sold, or commissions being paid out. Everything is included for a flat monthly fee the way it should be. To work with Ryan so you can feel more in control of your money, contact him and his team at drpodcastnetwork.com slash physicianwealth. Oscar Trimboli, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Bradley, looking forward to the questions and the conversation. So let's start off with your origin story. How does one go from working for Microsoft to an expert in deep listening? How does that how did that transformation take place? I need to zoom you into March 2012, where there's bushfires around the office buildings that we're in in Sydney. And you saw a bit of that just at the beginning of the year, how big forest fires can get here in Australia. And the smell of smoke was quite intense. It would made its way through the air conditioning system. And smell is one of those very fundamental things that fires up the memory really well. So whenever I think of this story, the smell of those fires comes through. And I'm on a video conference between Seattle, Singapore, and Sydney, it's a budget setting meeting. And there's six of us in the room from Microsoft Australia. Singapore is trying to be the peacemaker between head office and the Australian business as the regional business. And Seattle's trying to get as much budget as possible out of the country. And at the 20 minute mark, this meeting was really unproductive. I asked a question and uh, the meeting kind of changed the course a little bit, but my boss at the time, looked at me at, across the table and said, can you see me after this meeting? And all I could think, Bradley, was I'm getting fired. How many weeks of salary have I got left? This is this is not good. It's kind of like when your wife says, honey, we need to talk. <sighs> you, you just know nothing good would come out of that. So as present as I could stay during the meeting, I did. And the meeting actually wrapped up early. It finished, this 90-minute meeting finished at about the 45-minute mark. Everyone was quite happy with the outcome. And I looked to Tracy and I said, do you still want to meet? And she says, yes, and close the door. So it was like, honey, we need to talk and close the door. It's like, hmm, okay. So she says to me, you have no idea what you did at the 20-minute mark, do you? And I said, mm, in my head? All I'm thinking is, I'm getting fired and I don't even know why. Anyway, she said something quite profound and she said, the question you ask and the way you listen changed the entire trajectory of the meeting. If you could code the way you listen, you could change the world. 
And to be honest, all I was thinking, Bradley, was I'm not fired. I cannot believe this. I'm not fired. So put all that money out of that bank account in my head and put it back into the bank. And all I could say to Tracy was, Tracy, do you mean code or code code? Because it was a fairly fumbling response. And it's important to understand that the first thing people say isn't always what they mean. So she said, yes, Oscar, code. We work at Microsoft. I want you to code the way you listen. And I could not process that at all. I couldn't process that in the slightest way. And I skipped out of the door and didn't think anything of her challenge to me to code the way I listen. And then about six weeks later, Brian, our financial officer said to me, can you come into my budget setting meeting with my team? I want you to audit the way I listen. I said, Brian, I haven't got time for this listening stuff. You know how much money you guys landed in my budget this year? I I need to go and figure out how to do it. And for the first time in my life, I had to sit down and actually write what I thought good listening was. And now I'm on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world because Tracy listened beyond what I was saying and listening to what I was meaning in that meeting and kind of change what I think about listening. Although people would always say I've been a good listener all my life, whether that was at school because we had 23 different nationalities or in the workplace because I always ask people, that's that's wonderful, but tell me what the customer is actually thinking about this or what the customer would actually say about this. So in, in a lot of my work, Bradley, it's it's all about listening to what's not said rather than listening to what is being said. That's uh, that's the deep part of listening. Or I think a lot of what this podcast is about is taking things that some might perceive as innate mm. and figuring out how we can all improve at that. Like it seems like some people are innately funny, but in all likelihood they got a little bit of positive reinforcement early on And then every time they were funny, got some more and it got them to hone it or athletic or intelligent or something. So you, I'm sure, got positive reinforcement when you were a kid, like you went to an international school where lots of languages and you had other ways of picking up on on nuance. And so there was every time that happened, there was positive reinforcement and it got you to keep working on it, whether you realized it or not. What do you you think? Yeah, maybe. But in reality, I think this story is truer. So when I was 13, I had a, a immensely protruded jaw, like a werewolf. And, and I had braces for the best part of five years. And the last thing you want to do when you have this massively protruded jaw is to draw attention to yourself, to tell stories about yourself, to speak, in fact. So I got very good at deflecting and asking questions. So I actually had negative reinforcement to get me to become a better listener. Now, did I know that at that time? Absolutely not. It's only something I kind of joined the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle many years later. So my ability to carefully listen in a conversation and deflect so the attention was on them rather than me was a finely honed skill of my ego and its own survival because I didn't want to draw attention to my ugly jaw. And yet uh, at school where we live very close to an immigration centre, so I don't want anybody to feel like we went to an international school. We went to a very local school where uh, the migrants who are coming from war-torn Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, from war-torn parts of South America, people fleeing Eastern Europe, we had all kinds of languages and, and there was an Italian card game being played where people would play in pairs across the table diagonally from each other, Bradley. And the most important thing was you needed four to play this game and I was the pickup player. If they were short, they'd always substitute me in. And what these people always did was speak in their home language. So, you know, my Lao wasn't very good. My Vietnamese wasn't very good. It was non-existent, in fact. But because they let their guard down, I could see so much in the way their eyes were working, where their fingers were across their cards, because I had to tune in a completely different skill. Now, in that context, I was getting positive reinforcement because my ego loved winning card games. So how did you end up coding this, right? Right? You make the distinction coding versus coding because you're at Microsoft, so they didn't ask you to write lines of code. They wanted you to figure out your technique. 
They want yeah. to just figure it, dissect it, figure it out. So how did you end up, you know, when it's when it's your own self, I think that's a challenging thing to do. Mm. So how did you figure that out? How did you end up coding it? Well, it was the same practices I do for everything else, whether I wrote the book or the playing cards or the jigsaw puzzle game or the podcast or any of those things. It just came from listening to other people. So I started with listening to Brian. Wow, Brian interrupts a lot. I notice I don't. Wow, Brian asks a lot of very closed questions. I didn't do as much of that as he did. Or oh, his questions weren't flexible. He didn't have range. He asked too many why questions too early on in the conversation, not enough what and how questions later on. And so I went through this process of starting to code through observation, then through workshops, then through deliberate qualitative and quantitative research. We have three and a half thousand people in our database now that we're tracking who've said, hey, track my listening over time and see how I improve. And all the way along, we developed the model that is the five levels of listening. And, and we coded it not in a way that was academic, but it was practical and pragmatic. So I'm very lucky to have a number of mentors in academia, in, in Missouri, in Israel, in the Netherlands, who occasionally I bump problems off to and go, hey, is there any research in this field of listening? Or what's the validity of male-female listening? And is there academic research to support a difference in listening? And so coding into the five levels of listening is what we got to, is simply saying there's five orientations when it comes to listening. And most people aren't even capable of getting out of level one. Level one is listening to yourself rather than listening to the speaker. Most people don't have the foundation in place to listen to the other person because they've got a whole bunch of noise going on in their own mind. And as a physician, when you're seeing a patient, you're probably still processing the last patient conversation or you're trying to figure out what the waiting queue is outside your door or any other things, but you're not available there. So what we did, Bradley, is we coded it into the five levels of listening and we created playing cards for the five levels of listening so that people had really practical tips for them to be able to access ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of questioning as it relates to the way they listen to whoever they're engaging with. Now, all the evidence and work we've done in the research is all in organizations and workplaces, it's not coded for the home. So it's definitely for working environments rather than for home environments. So I'm not here to tell you how to have a better conversation with your wife, although sometimes it has unintended consequences as well. Yes, I could definitely use that uh, <laughs> as well. Maybe an interview for another day. Uh, yeah. Maybe on a different podcast. Uh, this is this is a physician specific. Yeah. So, but you know, for those of us with spouses, we uh, we I'm sh I'm sure there's I'm sure there is some spillover though from from yeah. one into the other. And your kids as well. Yes. Yes. I've heard you're not listening to me uh, probably a couple times even today. <laughs> and um, you probably weren't. Uh, well, I may have been. I may have been, but I just wasn't doing what he wanted me to do. Tell me, were you at eye level when he said that? No, there, he's very small. <laughs> yeah. There's, he's four. So a really quick hack yeah, for the parents out there, if, if you're struggling with getting your kids to listen, it's because your eye level isn't at their eye level. And by you either picking them up and putting them on a bench or you coming down to their eye level, it will change a perceived power dynamic and you will listen differently. So will I. Hopefully it doesn't change the actual power dynamic. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. I love that. So these types of hacks are really what I love to hear on this uh, on this podcast, not, yeah. not the theoretical, the, the practical. So speaking of practical, let's say, because you've already given us a bunch, a bunch of tips on, on how we can start improving our listening, right? Think mm. about the patient that's in front of you, listen to them. Don't think about uh, who's in your waiting room? Don't think about the patient. Make sure you are, and, and uh, we've discussed this in the podcast before, uh, and it's been said as, make sure you're present. Make sure you're present with the person who's in front of you. Is, yeah, you... and don't, don't start with the patient. That, that is the wrong place to start your listening. Really? You know? Absolutely. You, you, your, your foundation, if your orientation is on them, 
before they even come into your rooms, you need to be available. You need to be present. You need to have a space in your own mind. I, call, I say, how many browser tabs have you got open right now in your own mind? Mm. And for a lot of people, they got a lot. They got a lot of caseload. They got a practice to run. They might have some staffing issues. You might have a global pandemic going on. You might have parents you're worried about how many tabs are open. And, you know, I find it ironic that on a, a podcast of physicians, I don't have to explain the importance of just taking three deep breaths, just presencing yourself through taking three deep breaths, the importance of being hydrated throughout the entire day, not just with caffeine, but being hydrated throughout the whole day. If you, if you can get those two things in place for you physically. And the other thing is try to minimize the number of electronic distractions you've got. And then once you're present, sure, let's continue on and focus on the patient. But I always say, starting with focusing on listening to the patient is the wrong place to start. Because Bradley, if I asked you to write down 20 things you're thinking about right now, you could probably write 40 things, but most people aren't even conscious that their subconscious is processing that. So you could be processing, you know, oh, I, hope, I hope my son does this. It's unseasonably cold for this time in New York. Do I need the snow shovel right now? It could be many things that are going on before we even get to the patient. So for a lot of physicians, it's like, what is your ritual? And I'm sure BJ Fogg would have talked about this when he talked about his tiny habits. It's what's your ritual to get present in that moment for that patient? Because if you don't have a ritual, if you don't make it a habit, you're going to deliver inconsistent results. And one of the things I'm obsessed about is the commercial cost of not listening. So particularly in medical malpractice suits, simple things like not listening consistently over-indexed by a factor of five to one for doctors who do take a little bit extra time to listen well. Just that simple ritual of three deep breaths and drinking water can transform not just your practice experience and the success of your practice, but it will transform the experience of that patient and turn them into great referral sources for you. And uh, more importantly, they'll probably take the action you recommend in your diagnosis rather than anything that they say, yes, doctor, and then don't go and do it. Because I'm sure we didn't all go to medical school to have our patients ignore us. But how many aren't taking their medication right now? How many aren't doing their physical therapy work? How many of them are not doing the kinds of things you're prescribing for them? Is it an enormous waste of potential in society today? Some would argue that the onus is on the patient to do that. You know, they come to us for recommendations. We make the recommendations and that's it. And I would argue what you're arguing right here, which is that no, if you've made the recommendations and they haven't followed through with them, then you've done it, really done an incomplete job. You've done a, a disservice to them. And I'm sure that's happened to me with countless patients where I've made my recommendations and, and they haven't followed through. So I'm definitely not, not speaking, um, you know, from on high here. Uh, but I, I totally agree. The onus is on us not just to make the recommendations, but to make it such that they they follow through. Not, they want to follow through and they do follow through with them. Uh, I would take it a step further, Bradley. I think it's co-designed. It's a joint responsibility. Yes, yes. But uh, the physician has a great leadership role to do that. A simple example might be talking about a prescription and, uh, you know, Whatever the prescription is, quite often it's it's just prescribed. The, the opportunity in that moment is for the doctor to understand what might get in the way of you undertaking whatever the steps are for this. It might be exercise and whatever it is. I don't think enough medical and allied practitioners ask the question about barriers. So again, back to BJ Fogg and the work he does with habits, how do you break it down really small and how do you as the physician understand what is the real friction getting in the way of the patient taking responsibility for their care and their health rather than a bunch of pills, a bunch of exercises that doesn't really make sense to them. So I think that's the interesting listening opportunity for physicians to help the patients listen to what might get in their way of doing it rather than 
getting a yes no response from them so i love the uh the little reset that you said before you walk into the patient room right take three mm. deep breaths take a sip of water make mm. that a habit make it so that you do that every single time so you get consistent results mm. i love it do you have any other recommendations for closing those other browser windows for making sure we're present for that for that visit with the patient to making sure we have no other thoughts Un unwanted thoughts running through our head. Yeah, so the, this one is uh, prescribed with caution because understanding who's in the audience, you mightn't have this choice. But the biggest barrier to everybody's listening in our database and what the academic evidence says is electronic notifications, whether that's on a screen, on a phone, on a, on a pager, whatever that case might be. Now, not all of us have a choice to do this but how do we either minimize it or make the implicit explicit to the patient to say, hey, I'm on call right now. So if my phone rings, it's not because I don't want to listen to you. It's just that I'm on call. As opposed to you take a call and the patient goes, oh, okay. If you announce it, the patient has the context. If you don't announce it, all of a sudden the patient thinks you don't care. So for me, the number one in order of priority, number one, electronic distractions. Number two is three deep breaths. And then number three is a glass of water every half an hour. Now, they sound simple, Bradley, but it's the practice of doing that that is where the power is developed. So rather than looking for more, I just say, just stick with those three till you master those. I haven't met anybody who's mastered those yet. I want to just make a little modification to one of those. I, th I think... Personally, because I see 20 to 30 patients in a day, uh, you know, three deep breaths and a sip of water between each patient. Like make that part of your mm. routine and, and that'll make it more consistent. Uh, yeah. Just, you know, making the little sip of water more than, but I think honestly, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a minor point. It's a minor point. I'm just in my head, I'm trying to, right, I'm supposed to be listening and not having that thought run through my head, but it happened. And so now I'm going to get it yeah. out. Okay. I think, I think the other point on that is great listeners don't listen better than poor listeners. They just notice they're distracted faster. So you stop listening every 18 seconds because I'm not speaking fast enough. You can listen to 400 words per minute, but we generally speak between a range of 125 to 200 words per minute. You know, at New York levels, we're getting closer to 200. You know, in Australia, we're a little bit laid back at 125. So no, you will be distracted. And when you do, just have a practice to bring you back into the conversation. So some of us right now, we're, we're drifting away. We're thinking about a possible holiday that we could have once uh, airline travel is international. And all of a sudden you realize you're not in this conversation between Oscar and Bradley. So the difference is just get back into the conversation much quicker. But you can't do that if you've got all these browser tabs open. And, and it's just a mindset and a posture to go, right now, am I giving my attention to the patient or am I paying my attention to the patient. When you pay attention, it feels like it's a tax, a taxation. It, it, it's something that you have to do and you do it because you have to. Whereas when you give attention, it feels like an act of generosity. It feels like an act of curiosity. And I think one of the things I would always say is consistently distinguishing the better listeners is, is an innate curiosity. Not what they're saying, what are they meaning? How can I help them think this through a little bit further? How can I take them through the consequences of this in the context of their family? How can I take them through the consequences of this in their work? How can I take them through the consequences of this as their identity as a breadwinner in the family where I may have just been giving them a diagnosis that says that's completely taken away? I think too many of us, and particularly where time is short, which as a physician it is, too many of us just listen to what people say rather than what they actually are thinking and what they're meaning. And again, 
the maths, the neuroscience of listening tells us that when I speak, I speak at 125 to 200 words a minute, but I can think in a range of 900 to 1600 words per minute. Most of us are having a conversation with only 11% of what people are thinking. Is it little wonder that things go off track with the wrong prescription? Is it any wonder that a patient might feel like the doctor didn't listen to them when they could have just asked one more question to get to the same outcome? but it's how the patient felt about the experience rather than what you did. I think those are the things that we want to make sure that we know. Logically, I speak slower than I think. And yet as a doctor, we go, well, we've, we've got an allocated bit of time to see this patient. I want to do it in the most efficient way. And too many of the questions doctors ask, by the way, are all about the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the modern part of the brain, and most people turning up to a doctor are driven by the limbic system, the fear centre of the spinal column. And I always remember this story from Vanessa. She, she worked for Coke in Japan. She was a very fluent Japanese speaker. She was a, a, originally an exchange student, Bradley, and one of her friends got cancer and she ran 5Ks every day until there was a cure for cancer. So obviously she's still running. But a few years ago, she went in to see a doctor, an oncologist, after a prescription from a general practitioner and she took her husband with her for support. But she said, once the doctor said, yes, you have cancer, all that she could hear was the air conditioning. And whatever words were coming out of the doctor's mouth were just washing over her like the ocean. And in that moment, all that she was saying to herself, this can't be happening to me, and all the doctor thought that she was listening to what next set of procedures had to be. If it wasn't for her husband being there, she would have said she had no idea what was going on. You know, that makes sense what you said about the frontal cortex and the limbic system given my experience with how patients tell their story. Mm. Because more often than not, they don't tell it in chronological order, like you would tell any other story. They tell it in order of urgency. They mm. go from the most severe, the most urgent symptom to the least severe, least urgent part of the story, which mm. is not in chronological order, which is how at least I can't process I can't process the information that way. Ultimately, I let them tell their story and then I ask them to tell it again or I try to tell it with them again. And so it's in a way that I can hear it, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and as a simple phrase, uh, when we talk about the five levels of listening, this is a question for level three. You're right to kind of help them step through it in chronological order. Could you take me back to when you first noticed this? Could you take me back to when you first noticed this? And, and rarely will they start or provide you with the identical bits of information. You will start to feel the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle falling into place much quicker because all of a sudden they'll say, yeah, you know, happened in springtime. Actually, it happens every springtime. Yeah, it's happening every springtime. Yeah, yeah. No, usually they'll say it happened a little while ago. Yeah, And you don't know what they mean by a little while ago. It could have been an hour ago. It could have been three weeks ago. Um, so we, we often need to, you know, this is where the interrupting, unfortunately, has to come in because they're, they're giving us information in a way that it's not useful, right? Yeah, and a can I just bit, blow, you know, up, blow up a fallacy about interrupting and listening? Uh, all interrupting and listening is not bad. It's inappropriate interrupting that's bad. If, if you're the quiz show contestant that presses the buzzer before the quiz show host has said the question and you get the wrong answer, that's bad interrupting. A good listener is a lot like a book editor. They're trying to help you get to the essence of what you want to say in the most effective way for the reader. In this case, it's you, the physician. So Bradley, don't think all interrupting is bad. It's a big fallacy of listening because people perceive listening as a passive action. It's actually a very active action. And, and good listeners uh, interrupt very effectively, very productively, and very skillfully. Well, thank you for giving me permission to interrupt my patients because what we're taught is 
On average, doctors interrupt their patient within 18 seconds of the visit. And yeah. you know, you have to let them speak and you you can't interrupt. So we're so we're villainizing interruption. And you're saying, well, yes, as long as you're do- interrupting is fine as long as it's done appropriately in order to facilitate the story being told. So Correct. how do we differentiate between the two? How do we know if we're not just being a jerk and rushing the patient? Yeah, uh, I think a good example of this is is repetition. If the patient is repeating the same themes over a very short period of time, that's a great opportunity because what linguistically they're saying is, I can't find other words to describe this and I'm trying my best. And in doing so, I hope you can figure it out. So uh, repetition, so if they're, if they're repeating virtually identical information, that's a good time for you to explore the, the option to interrupt. Okay, so you know what I've heard you say, Mary, is that this happens every single Sunday night. Yeah. If you just take me back, oh, well, on Sunday night, my family comes over and always ends up in an argument. Oh, okay. That's a very different conversation to, okay, Mary, um, I've heard enough of that. Now, why are you here today? That's a very different interruption. So I think repetition is one good entry point for the conversation to be interrupted by the leader of the process, the physician in this case. The other time it's useful is if you notice that we are not making progress. So an example might be if you've got a 15 minute consultation window and the story's still going on at the five minute mark and they have not completed, the interruption option there is simply, given the time we've got available, what do you wanna get out of today? So you're coding to them, okay, time. And what you'll do is they'll find words. And often they'll have words like, well, actually, well, they go, hmm, now that I think about it, and and I'm sure you've seen the sigh in action where their spine will get a little bit more erect. They'll take that breath in and then they'll say exactly what they said for the last five minutes, but in a shorter, punchier version. So the two places I would look at entry points, Bradley, is... Skillful interruption helps when repetition gets past two. So if they're up to the third repetition around a theme. And then number two is where are we at with time and are we making the progress? That actually weaves in really well with an interview I did with Jonathan Winkle, who's a primary care physician, wrote the book Healing People, Not Patients, Mm -hmm. uh, where he says one of the ways to get through the the visit faster is to set the agenda at -hmm. the beginning. So what you're saying is you're letting the patient pick the agenda, you know, that that second interrupting technique is you're, you're telling them, right, we only have a little time left. What is this last little bit that you want to talk about? You're still, the ball is in their court, but you're, you're helping to move things along. I, and I think that that'll work really well. And we, we jumped a bit at the beginning. So if, if I was sitting there with, with a doctor and I was in there, earpiece and I was like giving them real-time feedback, I would always say, your role is to hold the process of the conversation. You should set the context up. Today, hey, we have 15 minutes, Mary. What specifically has brought you here today? I think one of the things, if you don't have a good relationship with Mary, she's a relatively new patient, try and limit the use of why at the beginning of a conversation why is perceived as judgmental, uh, whether you talk to suicide counsellors or FBI hostage negotiators, what and how questions at both the beginning of a relationship and the beginning of a consultation are going to be more productive than why-based question. Simon Sinek, we all love him, start with why. What he doesn't say is start with why when it comes to setting a strategy or a vision. Everybody takes that and go, let me apply, start with why to everything. He's a wonderful man from an ad agency and he would acknowledge that some of his success with why has been unsuccessfully deployed in the wrong context. So just be careful with why questions at the beginning. If you know the patient well, you can go to the why question. The other thing is more how-based questions, how would you like to finish up today? 
or how do you see this doing? I think a lot of time there's this mismatch power differential in the medical profession where the presumption is the doctor has all the power and yet if the patient has some agency, the evidence is quite clear that their recovery is not only quicker but it's more sustained as well and it's questioning and listening that's going to elicit that along the way, particularly for chronic conditions. What about silence? So I think silence can be a powerful tool, but at the same time, there are people in the waiting room, right? There are other people there. And so as physicians, the, the, as, as, if we are going to utilize silence, it's going to be hard to get out of our own heads and, and forget that there are other people waiting as inevitably happens. Uh, because that patient that you just mentioned that has the 15 minutes of our time, actually, they were 10 minutes late for their appointment. So now we only have five minutes left. But really, their issue is going to take us 20 minutes in order to figure out. So, you know, now we're pretty far behind and we have to figure out a way to catch up. So if we are going to utilize silence, how do we do it within the confines of that situation? Mm. And just like interrupting, Everybody assumes silence is always good when it comes to listening, and that's not true. And uh, I, I interviewed a, an emergency doctor from uh, Oregon oh, about a year ago, and one of the phrases she used really skillfully was, that question is important, and I'm thinking very carefully about it. And then she was silent. But because she signaled it, the silence were, felt acceptable, not like a weapon. And she said to me that often she felt it, the silence was longer than what the patient's perception of silence was. So she started asking questions about her own silence to the patient. And what she found quite often was nobody actually noticed, apart from the fact that she said it. I think Coming back to your question about is silence effective when you're running behind schedule? How urgent is the issue you're dealing with is my question to you. Rarely are the other issues you're dealing with in a consultation room as urgent as they might be in a hospital. So silence has a place. But is the silence useful for them or not? So is the silence useful for the patient or is it not? So that's a question only you can answer while you're sitting across from them. Because if they come in frantic and anxious and really rapidly speaking, you being silent is like two polar opposite magnets that are going to bounce off each other and there's no attraction, there's no relationship. So what we want to do in terms of creating a space is asking ourselves that very simple question, is silence going to be effective in this conversation? And for frantic, it will be effective kind of three to four minutes in as opposed to right at the beginning because right at the beginning, you're going to have to match the pace in the listening and then slowly bring them to a place where the conversation is going to be productive. Now, it's no coincidence that silent and listen have exactly the same letters. So it is powerful in a conversation You've just got to make sure that it's powerful for the conversation rather than just for one party or the other. So for her, if you've got the waiting room stacked back and it's not an urgent issue, silence is not going to be productive, Bradley. And in fact, it's going to increase your anxiety. Whereas if it's the first consult of the day and the opportunity is going to be useful, then use it. You, you might get a breakthrough. I'm already running behind at that point because that patient was definitely late. <laughs> inevitably, inevitably. The late patients come in early and the early patients come in late. So they're all there at the same time and they're all angry. So, okay. But no, but that's, I, I, I like that. It's, it's something to be used selectively in the right time, in the right circumstances and not just, you know, ha haphazardly. It's, yeah. it's, it's to be used methodically. Um, yeah. So we've been talking how, about how, physicians can listen better. Mm. I'd like to turn it around and, and ask how I can get my patients to listen better. Because some, I'll give you an example. 
And it might just might not be that they're not listening. It might be that my explaining is is not as good as it could be. Yeah. But if I have someone who comes in with sinus headaches, right? Mm. Most of the time, sinus headaches are not actually from the sinuses. It feels like they're from the sinuses. Your sinus sinuses feel full and pressure. And if you could just release that pressure, doc, then I'd feel better. Ultimately, these are usually a variant of migraine. So I diagnose them with a migraine and send them to a neurologist. And then they come back a year later and say, doc, my sinuses are bothering me again. So, you know, I, or, or they've seen the allergist. They've seen the allergist. The allergist has done allergy testing. All the allergy testing came back negative. And then they come and see me and say, my allergies are bothering me. So I'm able to review the note, see that that is not the case because they've already been told they don't have allergies. So, you know, we've communicated this message. How do we make sure that the message is being heard and understood? Mm. For a lot of prescribers, any brief taking profession, whether it's a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, an investment banker, the, the same is true that you are the expert and yet the language you use feels like Russian or Korean to the patient. And as much as we try and match the language we use to them, what you say and what they hear is completely different. So his his a simple question you could ask. And I'm, I'm curious if this will work. I've, I've actually spoken to an orthodontist and an ophthalmologist who've used this technique and were quite shocked. They, did, they, they tried it and were skeptical. So the technique is really simple. If they're married, ask them, how, how would you explain this to your partner tonight? Which often means they do it really quickly. Or how would you explain this to your children? How would you explain what I just said to your partner or to your children? What you'll hear back quite often is drastically different to what you've explained because what they're telling you is what they heard, not what you said. So back to our mythical patient, Mary, you would say, hey, hey Mary, if you were to explain this to Bill tonight, how would you explain what we've covered off? And she'd say, well, what you've told me is that my sinuses have got nothing to do with my nose and I'm still confused why that's the case. Or you've explained to me that maybe it's a migraine and I need to see someone else, but I can't make the connection. But rarely do you get to hear that because they just think it or it's in closed captioning in their brain as they walk out of the door. I'm curious if you'd be open to practice that one, Bradley. I just want to make sure that I phrase it in such a way that it doesn't seem patronizing, right? Mm. So I just want to make sure that I'm understood, that I'm, and I think it may, it phrasing it in such a way that, that the onus is on me to, to, to re-explain it. Not, I want to make sure that you understand me because then it sounds, make it makes it sound like the problem might be with their comprehension. So I yeah, think- so let me give you the paraphrase at the beginning. Yeah. Mary, you, you come in here once a year. I do this every day. And sometimes I take shortcuts in my language. So I'm, I'm really curious what you're hearing. How would you explain this to Bill tonight? Perfect. I was not as verbose as I would have made it. <laughs> yeah. So, so, it's so keep, yeah, and keep this in mind. Any question yeah. that is more than eight words is a biased question. The more neutral you can make the question, the more the patient will take ownership of the yeah. question. Whereas you go, oh, you know, um, look, I just want to make sure I'm understood straight away. That's like you're assuming I haven't. As opposed to setting the context, hey, I talk in a lot of shortcuts. I, I'm on a time limit. I, I you know, I, I use doctor language. I, I'm just want to make sure that when you speak to Bill tonight, how would you explain it to him? Excellent. There was so much more that I wanted to get to today. I had uh, so I'm, I'm happy you, to come you, back. You, you made me <laughs> pare it down because we had. I just had a huge list of questions for you, and uh, and you got me to focus it, and, and I appreciate it, but. Just one more parting question before we go. Mm. If your doctor, if you knew that your doctor was listening to this podcast, mm. right, and you had a recommendation for him or her on how they could improve their listening, 
and you can pick any of your doctors, right? Doesn't have to be someone specific so that in case your doctor is listening, they don't have to think that it's them. What recommendation would you have? Look, I'm, I'm neighbors with Dr. John, our family doctor, and his son, Frank, is a heart surgeon. So it's a true story. I, and I, I went to get a, a scan on my heart as part of a regular checkup uh, about eight months ago. And while I was being scanned under this big MRI, loud machine that spun around, the nurses said to me when it was complete, we've got a problem. We're going to have to do this again. And it's like, I'm having a heart checkup. My heart is literally sinking while I'm saying this. And then 10 minutes later, they look up and say, look, just stay there. We just want to compare the two images. And they come back and they say, unfortunately, we need to do a third. Like, so I'm here now 30 minutes, 35 minutes. It's my heart. I'm willing to accept this, Bradley. And then it's all complete. And then I go over to see Dr. Frank in his, in his room. And he has got that look on his face that is very, very confused. And I'm just thinking, I do have income protection insurance. I do have life insurance. This it's like is that Microsoft gonna... conversation all over again. Well, it's not going to be good. It's like they had to take three shots, right? And he looked at me and he says, Oscar, at your age, I've never seen anything like this. I was like, oh, God, okay. He says, I, I lecture at the university and we're actually going to use your arteries as an example of what's possible in your age. Uh, we're completely shocked about how clear your arteries are. Now, I'm freaking out for the yeah, last hour on, and a read half. read the room. <laughs> and, and it's like, if, like, the nurses were worried because they couldn't see any buildup anywhere. They thought the machine was faulty, right? Now, I'm sure they got things they can't say to me. Um, but they could have said something, like, throw me a bone. <laughs> so I think for, for Frank, and we joked about it, is like, you know, set a context right up front rather than drawing it out. So I, I, as a patient, I, I want you to listen to my emotions, n not, not just my symptoms. That's the thing I love all doctors to do. Listen for my emotions, not just my symptoms. Well, what I took away from that was not only am I an amazing listener, but I'm also in killer shape. <laughs> Oscar Tromboli, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We can find you. Your website is oscartromboli.com. And we can find the podcast there. We can find the book and the deck of cards. Thank you yeah. so much for your time. Thanks for listening. And if you want to take the seven-minute quiz to discover what your primary listening villain is, the website will give you that. And it'll also give you a really simple action plan and a couple of killer questions to make your time with your patients so much more productive. Thanks for listening. I love it. Thank you. Such a great show with Oscar Trimbley. But before we end, don't forget to reach out to Ryan, Casey, and the team at Physician Wealth Services by going to drpodcastnetwork.com slash physicianwealth to help you with your finances in the same way you take care of your patient's health. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.